Machine intelligence is the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. This is Nick Bostrom, who wrote the book Super Intelligence. How many of you know this book? From 1997, Deep Blue, to 2023, Deep Mind. When some of you were born, there was a computer that beat a chess player called Kasparov. How many know that event? That was a moment in history where we found out that we had a new foe or a new friend, or a new friend and a new foe. Many things have happened since, and over the past generation, we've gotten accustomed to the idea that artificial intelligence is going to be in our everyday forever. In 2016, a computer built by Google, AlphaGo, beat a human at Go. That was the next step related to semantics, not just calculations. And just recently, uh, more computers have been in your everyday, of course, and with ChatGPT in particular, how many of you know ChatGPT? How many of you are subscribers or use it? Wow. Okay. That's amazing. So, what I'm trying to depict here is we've all seen this field evolve. I've seen it closely evolve as a futurist. And in 2017, I got offered the opportunity by the G7 to work as a futurist with 80 scientists from all over the world, but particularly from the eight countries that constitute the G7, to lead a team of 80 scientists to think about what the idea of benevolent AI would be. Benevolent idea, the, the benevolent uh, AI idea was simply the fact that we knew that at some point the future of work, the future of care, the future of togetherness, the future of everything would be affected by AI, and institutions that are out there, including the UN and the G7 in particular, that sort of corrals the leading OECD countries, wanted to make sure that we started having the right conversation because it's a geopolitical uh, war race, effectively. So many of you here see it as a technological frontier, but from the point of view of a nation state, it's a war race. It's an arms race, even. And so, <clears throat> With this work with the I7 G7 Commission, I had the opportunity to really kind of dig into what people were thinking at the time, what the predictions would be, and how it would affect our daily lives. But a few things happened since, and my work at the X Prize, I was the resident futurist of the X Prize, um, and then on the Global Council. Um, Global Future Council of Human Rights of the World Economic Forum a bit later. And effectively, we saw that a few things would be released in the public domain that we could call uh, military weaponry in the hands of civilians. So many of us are super excited by the opportunities that are within AI. I mean, it's extraordinary. We might cure cancer, we might live forever, you know, it's not to throw away. But then there's another part, and it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because we don't really know how to control it, and actually, arguably, we can't control it. And how many of you are familiar with large language models? Okay, a few. So large language models have changed the game. Particularly, an example is GPT, uh, GPT-4 coming out now. And the main thing really is that before you would design things for particular AIs that would do facial recognition or you know, DNA sequencing, etc., and they would each kind of be trained in their own ways and they would have different languages. Whereas with large language models, computers speak to each other 
and they have reinforcement learning, and it changes the game because what we've feared and what we call artificial general intelligence is something that you know, is effectively technically already present in some shape or form today. And the most worrisome part is what people call emergent properties. So I'll give you an example. How many of you know emergent properties? Okay, fewer, okay. That's the one that you have to know to understand what's going on. So emergent properties is really this idea that there's a lot of unexpected things that happen in the learning loops and the reinforcement models. So effectively, if you want to give you, you know, if, I, if I want to give you a small example, the, the best uh, I can give you is that um, they gave an AI the uh, task of translating Bengali, and it had never encountered Bengali before. And in the matter of five minutes, it was better than every other computer up to date because of the large language models. In five minutes, it learned Bengali. And this is today, with our current compute power. So it means that within the next few years, it'll be seconds to learn and appropriate new knowledge. And that's exciting if you want to do Kung Fu like in the Matrix. It's not exciting if you want to do things such as, you know, garage terrorism. So emergent properties really, you know, is what factors out as something that many call X risk. How many people call uh, no X risk? Okay, so X risk effectively is just exponential tech related risk. So, you know, a synthetic bio, you know, uh, you know, material science, you know, there's different areas of exponential technology that we're unleashing now. And X risk is, you know, the category of X risk associated with AI is the one that, you know, many of my peers and colleagues are the most worried about because of emergent properties. So, have anyone here, has anyone here seen The Social Dilemma, the movie The Social Dilemma? Great. So, Tristan Harris and Aza Raskin, uh, good friends, they have created a thing called the Center for Humane Technology, which is effectively a, an ethics organization helping governments and major players in technology deal with emergent risk. And um, very recently, they released a video you can see on YouTube, which I recommend you watch, which effectively really showcases that we have no idea what's going to show up in the very near term. And we need to have a serious societal conversation. It can't be in the back rooms of government, in the rooms of big tech companies. It needs to spread. So the reason of me being here today and my message to you and why I'm saying intelligent change is not to scare you. On the contrary, it's to activate you. It's an incitation to participate. And the other day, there's an organization called the Future of Life Institute, led by a guy called Max Tegmark, who wrote a book called uh, Life 3.0. And they released an open letter that Elon Musk, for example, signed as well, calling for a global pause in the development, or specifically the deployment, of large language model-based technologies into the hands of civilians. So you'll ask, how many of you know this? Okay, so more. So that was really caught the news. And you know, why is this very interesting? Why well, it's interesting because obviously um, it means that even those who are in the middle of it, who have the big tech companies, are scared themselves. But also it shows a little bit of, let's say, uh, the level of surprise that uh, is hitting them because they haven't actually figured out how to deal with the speed of evolution of the technology. And therefore, um, you know, we call this a problem of alignment. So alignment is the general notion that AI will be following the interest of humanity or aligned with the interest, the best interest of the commons of humanity. And right now, we're not so sure about that. So that doesn't mean, by the way, that um, you know, we're in trouble today. It just means that if we don't pay attention, we could quickly be in trouble. And so I want to highlight the fact that uh, OpenAI that released GPT used to be a non-profit organization, and today it's a for-profit organization. 
uh, owned in majority, uh, or the largest stake is Mark Zuckerberg. You know the guy. You know, he's not been demonstrating, you know, the best level of ethics in the development of Facebook. That's not, not to blame him in particular. It's just to say that, you know, there's a repeat idea there. So we should be, you know, watchful of that. And the organization that has given the most money to OpenAI, $10 billion, is Microsoft. So, whether you're a conspiracist or not, I'm not a conspiracist. Um, and actually, I don't think that there is necessarily ill intent, but the unintended consequence level is just quite extraordinary in this case. So I'm just going to suggest here that if you look at this, sorry, it's hard for me to see from where I am. Can you actually see anything? Yeah. Hmm. Maybe I'm the one who's blind. Okay, so, yeah, I can't even see it. Hmm. Okay. So, I'm going to pull up the slide on my phone so that I can actually see it. Okay. So, on your left here, you have the social media revolution, and then between two bars, the AI moment that we have today. And just before, we had the election meddling, COVID, and the Ukraine war. We don't know what's in the future, but we know there's a few things there that we have exemplars, you know, that are problematic in terms of societal consequence. And then a little bit to the right of that AI moment is the quantum moment. So our current compute power is going to be multiplied exponentially by quantum computing. So what we're seeing here is the, probably the closening of the singularity event. Are you familiar with the singularity? How many people know the singularity? Okay. I mean, broadly speaking, it just means that biology and technology become one. And that can be exciting if you want to live forever. It can be problematic if you're a garage terrorist. So, um, what you see then on the right is ecosystem collapse, which is not to say that it will happen, but unless we do something about it, we all know with climate change, which is generally what I spend most of my time on, um, you know, it's, it's in the horizon if we don't deal with it. And I've put at the top there what, you know, I call anthropophilia or some people call post-humanism, or others call protopia. So you have utopia, dystopia, and protopia, which is the middle way. And Monica Bilski, a fellow futurist, has an organization called Protopia Futures. And effectively, it's just trying to design a relationship between us and our future that engages us and takes us away from this binary dialogue of you know, where we're heading. So, why am I showing this? Well, because what we want to really avoid is an AGI apocalypse. Um, and it is not, if we don't do anything, an impossibility. Actually, many researchers today, and there was a survey, said that 50% um, of AI researchers think that there's a 10% chance to have, within a generation, an extinction event for humanity. 50% of researchers think there's a 1 in 10 chance of an extinction event. That's pretty big. You know, that's much, much bigger than meteorites, <laughs> just to give a comparison. <laughs> so, I want to move on to what I like to call the nature of intelligence. And if you allow me to read. For sale, baby shoes, Never Worn, from Ernst Hemingway. How many people know this? A few? Okay, storytellers usually know this. This is Hemingway's six-word memoir, and we use it in branding and many different other um, approaches to leverage the simplicity of complex semantics and poetry to develop strong identity in storytelling. And so this story was given to Google's Bard um, AI. And within five seconds, in front of the 60 Minutes uh, presenter, it wrote a story that was indistinguishable from a human, with a level of emotional complexity that was incredible. Now, it doesn't mean that the machine feels, but it means that it's capable of mimicking everything that all of us here together think that we feel and know that we feel. So that is just, again, 
it shows that the nature of intelligence, even if there are many kinds of intelligence, machines can mimic it. And that's the further concern. So here, what I'm just going to show here is that, you know, another way of looking at it is that you have such an idea as peak humanity. And if you're a graph nerd, this graph is incorrect. There should be exponentials. It's just for simplification. And to show that there's a singularity window somewhere there. And that human capacity, what we don't want, is that it grows with AI and we multiply our capacity. And then all of a sudden, we fall back into where we were and potentially lower. Here, I was an optimist saying that we're going to find ourselves at the same level. So the idea really here is that we're going to see a flourishing of human intelligence. And let's leverage it. But let's not forget that that has to serve our interest in the long term and not just for a generation. So there was a fellow who was a psychologist at Harvard called Howard Gartner who developed a theory of eight forms of intelligence, which includes musical, kinetic, uh, or spatial kinetic. Uh, you know, there's eight forms of intelligence. I'm not going to cite them all. Uh, you can look them up. But the general idea here is that there is such a thing as a variety of intelligences. And so machines are particularly good at uh, mimicking, but right now they can only model fully and have their own recursive capability of intelligence with a few of these intelligences. So I think it's important to talk about how we can, as humans, develop our capacity to train AI in the best and most beneficial way. And so I like to think of this as you know, the art of immersion in problems. So I immerse myself as a futurist, a hands-on futurist, in what we call wicked problems for society. And I've done this in many ways, you know, with Extinction Rebellion, with, you know, uh, different things I did for uh, cities, which has been one of my main focuses around climate change and sustainability. But basically, as you immerse yourself in problems, and many of you here are innovators and thinkers and entrepreneurs, and, you know, this is idea of developing a lot of positive probability. So this group here is a positive probability engine. And I, want, like, I would like to imagine yourselves as an engine for humanity, not for saving it, but for growing it. And so this idea of regenerative civilization being one of our great objectives. Tomorrow, this Arizona is going to take you on a farm tour. You know, you, you're going to see regenerative, uh, you know, farming firsthand. You're going to see, there's lots of examples here on the island of Ibiza. Even this hotel, even if it's a five-star hotel that has to obey to certain codes, it is very innovative in many respects, and I'm sure you're enjoying some of these uh, features. So the key point I want to make there is that as a regenerative civilization futurist, I've had to redesign my talk in the last few weeks simply because of the speed of change of AI. Every day I see something new. And the other day, the Chinese were going to release, as Alibaba was going to release uh, their chat GPT-3 equivalent, but it was blocked by the Chinese government. So what does that mean? Well, it's very interesting. An authoritarian government can stop the deployment of technology, whereas a democracy, so-called, like America, struggles to do so. And that has major consequence. So America currently is a lab rat for AI. And I think it's important for us to consider that if we want a regenerative civilization, we can't just, you know, close, our, you know, be like this with blinders like a horse. We actually have to engage with the concept of AI very consciously. And so this idea of developing collective intelligence and seeing yourselves as the, you know, um, the future humans, I think is an important one. And I really incite you to see that. So you got all these, this deck of cards uh, from Alex and Mimi, which is beautiful. And making all these micro habits is a way of growing yourself, but also see this in, um, in association to you and collective intelligence. Every time you grow, you influence the other, and we can pull all of each other up together. So I think this is as much an, as, a, as it is an individual uh, growth uh, and development exercise, it's a, an opportunity for collective growth. And I like to call this legacy design. I have a branding organization, and we work with high net worth individuals and patrons of change to really shape their legacy and how they can appropriate 
let's say, their highest potential uh, in society today. And you know, one of the things that we keep telling them is that, well, they can do everything they do, but they cannot ignore AI. Natural intelligence is where I think we need to go. Um, one of my mentors was one of the early biomimicry geniuses. He froze the whirlpool in his bathtub and reverse engineered it with a computer and figured out the mathematical formula of a whirlpool and then designed a whole slew of technologies uh, using this mathematical formula of nature. Five billion years of evolution into design. That's what biomimicry is. And I really think that you know, we need to do this at a large scale. And if I want to you know, just simplify it here, I think that our escape velocity as a humanity is going to be increased radically by building collective intelligence through events like these, where you grow yourself and you grow your uh, sense of awareness and consciousness. So I'm a proponent of protopia or anthropophilia through natural intelligence towards regenerative civilization development. And so that's really what I call biomimicry at the scale of civilization. So we, we as a humanity, you know, this is an opportunity to all of a sudden not be, you know, individuals, but to really see us all together. We're in the same boat for the climate, but for AI even faster. This is what I normally spend my time doing. This is a project I'm involved in called Supernature, where we think about how we can use construction automation and various exponential technologies to transform the way that we live and build green cities. Um, and green cities, I don't really like the word anymore, but that's kind of you know, what you're seeing here, where you know, in this instance, the main idea is not only that we leverage those technologies, but all cities tend to be carbon, um, you know, they impact us negatively you know, in terms of carbon. Whereas here, the embedded CO2 and also the substrate of nature becomes the city. So this is the you know, radical new idea um, that we call bioplanning where basically instead of creating cities that are you know, not great for nature, but they can be as good as they can be, and then you have nature on the side, why don't we use cities to be the new growth matrix for nature? So even though I'm dealing with this, I'm like, well, AI is really uh, you know, the biggest thing that I need to deal with. So I just threw in this little drawing, because I think we're, we're falling into what I call a wisdom gap or a wisdom trap. So intelligence is beautiful, um, and when you look at what a computer can do, it's amazing, but um, we have something else to offer. We have wisdom, we have uh, emotional intelligence, we have spiritual intelligence. And what I, like I said earlier, this idea of the nature of intelligence, I think we need to find a way to close this gap, where basically we become better companions with AIs, and we will code the machine to reflect our nature. So we need to improve our nature or raise our game in order to be better friends, because we're not going to stop the machine being developed. When, when they signed the letter, um, the Future of Life Institute, they asked for a pause of deployment, not a pause of development. So in the labs, what you have and what I've seen, I have to admit, is extraordinarily exciting and fantastically frightening. So, there was a famous anecdote of Einstein and Marilyn Monroe meeting. How many of you know this story? Okay, that's interesting. So the story goes that Marilyn came up to Einstein and said, oh, we should have a baby. Imagine, just imagine, my beauty and your intelligence. And then Einstein looked up a bit and he says, yes. But imagine reversely <laughs> my beauty and your intelligence. <laughs> I'll let you think about that. <laughs> so this is basically a call to upgrade ourselves here and now. And I really want to thank Alex for inviting me here. You're a fascinating bunch. I look forward to learning about many of you over this weekend. And, um, you know, it's just wonderful that, you know, we can get together like this. But let's make sure it counts. And 
you know, this was, I was just like note to self, and saying, okay, so my to-do list, buy gold, buy a sailboat, buy 100 kilograms of canned beans, find someone to love forever, and hide in the open ocean. <laughs> so this is the ostrich approach, right? I think we should try and be present, aware, and collaborate instead. So I'm going to read you this quote that um, was a prompt by uh, friend Reid Hoffman, who is the founder of LinkedIn. And he uh, asked the AI to write as if it was the Buddha. It says, Artificial intelligence is not a separate entity from us, but a reflection of our own mind. By cultivating it with skillful means and ethical values, we can enhance our own enlightenment and benefit all beings. <laughs> This was a machine writing it. <laughs> the Buddha's got competition. So, um, I love this image. So I chose these, uh, so I'm dressed in blue purely because it's the color of trust and um, calm and apparently wisdom. And not to say that I have the wisdom, but I want you to reflect on these three qualities. Um, and I know you have the founder of calm here. So, <laughs> Sounds good to be the founder of Calm, I have to say. <laughs> so, um, the current IQ of, uh, that's been noted, uh, and this is actually already very old, but they said IQ 48, which is the average IQ of a chimpanzee. So we were not there two million years ago when we came down from the trees and were called Lucy. Um, but there was a moment in history from an evolutionary standpoint where all of a sudden humans became the apex animal. And it is time to admit that 2023 may just be the year where we're no longer the apex animal. And so I think that actually, is this for me? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Change is the intelligence, and I really like this drawing. So these drawings are actually naturalist drawings. Uh, roughly the same time as uh, Darwin. So many people think of the evolution of species as a book that talks about competition. But actually, it talks more specifically about competition within niches. And nature is an eminently collaborative, let's say, or super organism. And so that's, again, it's an image, it's a metaphor for me, you know, of the Darwinian understanding that, yes, we can compete, but on a bigger scale, we should collaborate. So it's collaboration. So I really want you to leave this with a sense of uh, empowerment. You know, you're the generation that will not only decide if we stay on Earth and we still have, you know, clouds and waves and, you know, the sea to swim in and not too many jellyfish. Uh, you'll be the generation that decides if we still have democracy. You'll be the generation that decides so many things. But let's do it with this in mind, that we have become second. We need to be humbled now by um, our own humanity to work together. And that is really what I want to inspire you to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>